Good morning, One Hope. My name is Devante and I serve as the pastoral associate here for anyone that might be joining us this morning. One Hope, we just got done with our Holy Spirit series. I wanted to just shake it off, just shake off the, the, it was a long series and I get that, just shake it off a little bit and just be encouraged. And I, it was such a beneficial series as we engage with what I believe, one of the important parts of our faith, that, that the Holy Spirit who does work in us daily and we tend to forget. It's, it's, he's called the most forgetting part of the Trinity. And so I was encouraged uh, to be able to go through for a few weeks, understanding him, engaging with the material the Bible tells us about him and being able to actually ground ourselves in understanding who the Holy Spirit is. So I pray that that was beneficial to you as it was to me, and I hope that you can use that to grow in your faith as you understand the Holy Spirit. Well, we're wrapping up summer here, and I'm going to be our last sermon, at least from your pastoral staff, um, then we're going to have some guest preachers until our fall kickoff, and I want to give us an encouraging word from the scriptures. If you're like anything like me, your spiritual health has taken the back burner to all the things that probably have gone on in this world this, this past year. You might have been focused on your physical health because of the virus or the political climate or just the situation that's going on in the world, worldwide. I mean, all the different things that's going on, somehow, some way, your spiritual life kind of fell to the back burner. If that's you, know that you're not alone. I find myself struggling with that same thing. Um, But I realized that our spiritual life and our spiritual health is so very important. It's probably, most likely, the most important thing in our lives. It is important to us, One Hope. Very important. And I know it's sometimes hard because doing video church and being socially distant from one another can, come, can become hard um, and can be, cause us to be a little bit distracted. And so we fall off the wayside a little bit, and I get that. Um, so I want to give us an encouraging word about that. I am also want us to understand that this is the time that the enemy usually uses to seep in, to try and use this time of distance to really get us in. Sin starts to creep in. And I like this quote my, my former mentor back in Spokane used to say. He said this. He said that, that uh, sin will, sorry, let me get here. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing to pay. Let me say that again. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you are willing to pay. So before we get into the slum, I want to give us an encouraging word to help us to be able to rejuvenate our spiritual life coming to the end of this summer and get ready for a fall kickoff, to be able to, 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 to invest in our relationship with the Lord and grow in Him. So why don't you join me? I'm going to be in Romans 5. And let me pray before we jump in. God, go with me before I preach this message. Holy Spirit, I need you. Help us to be in tune with you, Lord. Help us to be listening to you. Let what you have to say to us stick, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to receive it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles with you or your phones or whatever, I want you to turn to Romans 5. I'm going to start at verse 1. Here it says this, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, when I was growing up, it's this, 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 the saying used to happen, and maybe, I don't usually hear it now, actually, in the church much anymore, um, but, but back in the day, the saying used to come up which says, hey, you better get right with the Lord. 
And the saying used to come up a lot when uh, people would be struggling or they would find themselves drifting or, or, or staying away or different things like that. And, and you, you would hear some of the older members say, hey, you, better, you better get right with the Lord. You better get right. Get right. Get right. And I remember thinking in my head when I heard this that it's something that I needed to do to get right. What does it mean to get right with the Lord? Now, I look at the passage where the, the, the first section of Romans 5, and it talks about having peace with God. And when I first read that as a new believer, I, in the back of my mind, I, I keep hearing this get right with God. And I, I assume that, that this getting right with God had to do with this peace with God. Now, when I looked at that, I want to I wanna break that because I don't think that that's what the text is actually saying. Matter of fact, we know that because Paul te- is telling us in the text, if you look at the text, is that he is saying, therefore, since, past tense, you have been justified. You now have peace with God. And so that peace that we have is based upon our justification, our salvation we already have in Christ Jesus. So now that we've already been saved, this, 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 this thing, this, this peace that we have is a result of the salvation. This is not something you get prior to becoming saved. Now, a lot of people in our lives, even with sin, we do this thing where we believe that we must fix ourselves or become better of ourselves or this better version of ourselves to be able to come to God in repentance. If when I was, was, was younger, um, before I was even a believer, but just a young kid, I remember wanting to deal with my sin first before I come to Christ and say, okay, Father, forgive me. And different things like that. I would, I would before I, I would come and lay at, at the feet of Jesus, I would try and deal with it myself. And I would try to have this peace in getting right with God prior to coming to God himself. Well, this is not true. Because the Bible tells us that this peace that we have is a result of our justification. If you were taking notes or you, or you, you kind of have memory notes, this section of Romans 5 is actually talking about the results of our salvation, the results of justification. It is actually talking about what is the result based upon us now being in this relationship with Jesus Christ. The first result we can base upon this first section of the chapter is a relationship. Now, you know this, you know, it's, we talk about this all the time at One Hope. We, we do. We talk about how Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not only something that's just out there, it's actually a relationship. If you remember my previous sermon, I talked about how relational Jesus is based upon faith and how we should interact because we have faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that we can believe and have faith, knowing that things are not too good to be true. Do you remember that? Yes, I did talk about that. And I realized that we have this misconceived notion that because we are now in a relationship with God, we must now work and get things fixed and then come to Him, which is also not true, even if you're in a relationship. Because knowing that we have already been justified, we can now come to Christ knowing that we have no hostility with him. And this is what this peace actually means. It's a peace that is without hostility. Yes, we were hostile towards Jesus Christ. Hostile in a way that, that was in rebellious, rebellion sorry, against him. So this is what makes our relationship with him kind of fresh. It's this peace we now have with God the Father through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm in a marriage, and you married folks out there know this very well. We know that when there's tension in our marriage and even in our relationships with friends and different things like that, when we have this tension, there's something that's off balance. There's something that's not right. This is a way that we want to use to, to kind of just latch in and to get things better and bring peace. A non-peaceful relationship is hectic. It's hostile. It's not good. But Jesus has made this relationship peaceful for us through Jesus Christ. So then it comes down to an investment. Yes, it is an investment 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an investment of him in our lives and us into our relationship with him. Church, if you know anything about investments, I'm sure you guys do. It's in for the long run. Investments are not something that we, we put in and we take out. We put in and we take out. It's something that we do constantly as we invest and we wait for the long-term outcome so that we can see the benefits of what we have invested. I think the same thing is with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We look at our relationship and over time, over the time we've spent in our relationship with Jesus Christ, we will see ups and downs and rounds and rounds, just like when we invest in stock market, in the stock market and bonds, there's an up cycle and a down cycle and different things like that. Same thing when we invest in our relationship with Christ. Sometimes we are working hard, sometimes we see progress, but sometimes it's two steps back. Sometimes it's five steps forward, sometimes it's two steps back, sometimes it's five steps back. But it's a relationship that's worthy of the investment that we put in. Now, I'm not here to tell you that this investment, this work that you put in, is how the relationships get better because it's also, at the same time, God working in us to grow us in our relationship with him. So in this season, if we find ourselves distant from our social, our social part, um, uh, sorry, our spiritual part of our relationship with Jesus Christ, know that God is continually reaching out to us, working in us, and it's our response in the power that he's given us through the Holy Spirit to respond in that relationship and continue to invest. But what happens when we pull out our investments too early? Sometimes we miss the benefits of a long-term investment. Sometimes we miss the benefits of, of actually seeing the fruit of spending time investing. That same thing can also happen in our relationship with the Lord. So, understanding our relationship with Jesus, we can then say that it's a type of investment that we have in Jesus Christ. But I want to go to the second part of this because I think that understanding this relationship could kind of and let us end up in this kind of lackadaisical way of living life. And Paul here tells us that it's the walk with Jesus is not always... Uh, a walk in the park with the wife, the kids, and the dog. It's not always that way. If you look at Romans 3, um, oh, sorry, Romans 5, 3 through 5, Paul says this, not only, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, Paul is saying we glory in our sufferings. That sounds weird. I could be real with you. In reading that and hearing this thing come out of the mouth of an apostle just sounds weird. We glory in suffering? Who does that? If you glory in suffering, like really just have a good time and say hallelujah every time you suffer, let me know. If you were to, to um, go to the doctor and they tell you that, and the doctor tells you that you have COVID, you probably wouldn't say hallelujah, I have COVID. That's just not what we see. This is not just rejoicing, this glory, this glorious time in our suffering. Or you find out that somebody has cancer. Or your kids walk away from you and don't want you to have a relationship with your grandkids. It's not a glorious time. It doesn't seem like. When life hits the fan and things get rough, it doesn't seem like we raise our wine glasses and give a toast. Kind of weird. But it's true. As believers, we do find ourselves in a glorious position when it comes to our suffering. See, what happened is the world has teach us this thing. Culture has really taught us that, our, that, that, that happiness is the, the, the way to go. If we can just be happy, then that is the way to the best life ever. If we could just be so happy, then things would be okay. And when happiness is gone because suffering has stepped in, we feel hopeless. We want to give up of the investment that we've put in. 
But this is not true, actually, for the Christian believers, because we understand that even in the midst of our suffering, there's something that's different than happiness that we have. And that, happy, that, 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 that emotion change of happiness to joy. That we can have joy in our sufferings, even when we're sad, even when we're down. We can have joy knowing that God is with us, God is for us, and he's not against us. We can know this to be true. So then, what do we do? How do we then relate to our suffering know that we have, knowing that we have joy in Christ, knowing that it's Christ that works in us so that we can, we can invest in the relationship we have with him, knowing that God and Jesus, Jesus himself has sent a Holy Spirit to indwell us, that we can live in his glorious majesty with him, reign with him when he returns. Now that we know that, now that we understand that, how then do we live in light of our suffering? Well, then we ask the question, Lord, what are you teaching me in my suffering? Lord, what are you trying to teach me? How are you trying to grow me in my suffering? This season of life might have many of us in suffering. Lord, what are you trying to teach me in the season of COVID? What are you trying to teach me in the, se- in the season of civil unrest? How can I learn and grow in this? And how can I persevere? Remember, the Bible tells us, if you look at our text, Um, This morning, it says this, um, that suffering, this is is verse 3, suffering produces perseverance. Now we know that perseverance is something that's not common anymore, at least in this culture. Probably wasn't even common in the past, really, to to people who didn't trust in Christ. Perseverance is not something that we, we, we we tend to see. If we don't like it, we let it go. It's That's just simple. It's a fast culture, fast pace. I have a, actually an amazing story about this. Things uh, back in the past were built to last. I'm going to say it again. Things back in the past were built to last. That's just how it was. And I think about how today we build things, and it's almost like things are built to fail. I think about new cars and cars, although they are w- built way better. Way better. Cars are doing way more mileage than they did in the past. But if you look at the cars in about, a, about the 90s, especially like the Toyotas and the Hondas that are still running today 200, 300,000 miles, sometimes you realize that those cars are pretty much bulletproof. They can run forever. But today, cars are getting so te- technological and cars are lasting about seven years, some of them, and they're starting to really malfunction and break down and different things like that. And so what I'm seeing is that things are not willing to last. Just go to the next thing. I find this even with the, with the iPhone. The iPhone, I love iPhones. I'm an Apple person. If you know me well enough, you'll know that I'm really a big Apple product guy. But I realized that Apple somehow has us always moving to the next thing. There's no persevering with the thing you have. It's actually this thing of just like, keep going to the next thing. But I also see that in relationships. When friends have, have wronged you, when friends have done you bad, we, we pick up this tendency that, well, we don't need those friends anymore. Instead of reconciling the relationship with those friends, we, we turn away. We walk away. There's no need to persevere in that relationship. Or even in our marriages. Well, my spouse isn't treating me the way I want her to be treated. My spouse is not making me happy. And then I walk away from that. I, I say, bye-bye. Find a new spouse, right? My job is not making me happy. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not what I really feel comfortable with. Oh, I just... Oh. I just want to move on to the next thing. We find ourselves in a culture that's selling us get more stuff, be more better, be more, be, be, get the next best thing. When maybe that's not the case. Maybe that's not the case for us to get the next best thing, but to persevere. And we don't even see that in our own time here. But we could ask ourselves the question, though. God, in our suffering, what are you teaching us? I think Paul actually answers that question for us. He's teaching us to persevere. Do not give up on the relationship we have with him, but to persevere because it produces that. It produces a growth. Actually, James talks about this in his book. He's talking about the 12 tribes that were being persecuted, and he tells them this, James 1, 2-4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, 
Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let us persevere, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. James tell, tell these people that are being persecuted to let perseverance finish its work in them. Can, can perseverance finish its work in us? See, we have sometimes missed the importance of what perseverance does. It shows us that because we're empowered, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can then persevere until the end because God has empowered us to do so. When I look back on times of suffering in my own life and I see how I persevere, all I could do is give thanks to God for what he has done in my perseverance. This then leads to what Paul tells us, character, character. Yes, now I look at it, I, per- I persevere, and instead of boasting in my perseverance and boasting of what I've done, I can now humbly come to God and say, it's you that have, have pushed me to persevere, and it's you that have built my character. It's you that makes, make me, made me better and continue to make me better. But character is a serious thing. Character is something that's molded and, it, and, it, and it's fashioned and it, over time it grows and it gets better. We grow into better character over time through different circumstances of life and situations that happen. It's because of our, our molding that God continues to fashion us like a clay. He's working in us and molding us and, and our character grows. It grows. And so we have to allow God to work on our character. Then it goes on to say that character produces hope. Now, we see a progression here of things that's happening. There's a suffering, which produces perseverance. Perseverance, which then produces character. And character, which then produces hope. Now, how could you then have hope after all these things, you know? You see suffering, and you see things that are happening, and you ask yourself, how could I have hope in light of this? It's coming to Jesus and resting on that first part of what I talked about in my sermon, which is the relationship part. The relationship is important, and it's resting in that relationship that gives us the hope to know how to move on. Hope is, look at hope like this. Hope being H-O-P-E can be said to be having only positive expectations. Having only positive expectations. So that's even when maybe it doesn't look like what we want it to be. We can trust that, 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 that we can expect, sorry, that whatever God is going to do is going to be good and going to be right at the right time. God is going to do what he's going to do, and it's going to be great if we trust on the sovereign Lord. Lean into him and allow him to do a good work in us and in the world, trusting that even though in the midst of all the suffering, all the pain, all of the sin in the world, that at the end, God will reign victorious, then we rest in the fact, maybe we don't understand, and to be honest, we don't understand, I don't understand how and why so many bad things happen, but I can rest in the fact that I have hope. I have the having only positive expectations. I have this positive expectation that in the end, Jesus will reign, and I know for a fact, and we will reign with him, church. Reign with him forever. What a glorious day to look forward to. What a glorious day to be with Jesus, to, 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 be, to be fully in his presence, whatever that may look like. To rest in the fact that you are with your king, your friend, your comforter, your companion. Now, I like what Paul does here in this, in this chapter, because Paul does something I think is amazing, understanding that the first part is telling us that the results of our, our salvation, our justification is a relationship 
with Jesus. It's this peace that we now have. There's no more hostility. The second piece is understanding that we rejoice in our sufferings because of our salvation in Jesus. We can now rejoice. That rejoicing is not necessarily happiness, but it is a joy that we then have, the joy of being with Jesus and understanding that he perseveres us, builds our character, and gives us hope. Paul does something amazing. If you want to just look in our text at verse 6, Paul's pretty much going to give us the example of those exact same things. This blew my mind, one hope, when I saw this in the text. I realized that Paul shifts gears and actually gives us an example of suffering, perseverance, character, and hope. Let me show you what I mean. Starting at verse 6. You see... At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us. Sorry, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since we... Since we now have been justified by his blood, now, sorry, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we have, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Now, let me back up a bit and show you how Paul shows us an example of suffering, perseverance, character, hope. Go back to verse 6. Paul says this, that, you see, at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That is right there. It's the suffering and the perseverance. If you know anything about Christ's death, it was not an easy thing. Matter of fact, we look back in the scriptures and see that Jesus, at his prayer to the Father, said, If there is any way, let this cup pass. Jesus is asking the Father, knowing what's going on. In that, though, he sees that he is the only way and in love perseveres to the cross and die a gruesome death. But we know the, rest, the story doesn't end there. Rose and conquered death and then ascended to the Father and interceded for us. We know, we know this based upon scripture, but that's just the suffering and the perseverance. So what's the character? Well, let me show you the character. Look at verse 7. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. So if you take that verse and take what Paul has said about us in verse 6, that we were still powerless and we were ungodly, <laughs> and then you look at verse, sorry, then you look at verse 8 where it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for people that were not righteous. And Paul is telling us really someone would do something like that. Look at the character of Jesus. That not only did he suffer and persevere to the cross, but then in th through that his character is shown because the people that he were dying for is the same people who put him on the cross. The same people who sin against him, who doesn't want to be in a relationship with him, who wanted to be hostile against him. It is those people that Jesus died on the cross for. It's those people. It's us. It's us, sinners like me and you, who Jesus went to the cross for. And at the end of the chapter, tell us, it tells us why he went to, to, to the cross. So that we can boast in God through Jesus, through whom we have received reconciliation that now the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and the Father we have because Jesus deemed it fit that he would suffer, he would persevere, and his character proven to die for people who, who literally don't deserve it so that we can be reconciled to him. What a message. 
What a message to show us that in this first section, this relationship that we have and this investment that we put in to this relationship that we have and understanding that in our sufferings, we can have joy and we can persevere and our character has grown and understanding all that, that. But Jesus set an example for us in this. So when we look at our text today, when we look at Romans 5, we can say that Paul didn't only tell us how the results of our, uh, the results of our, our justification, but he also uses Jesus as an example to show us that these things are indeed important to our spiritual walk. So one hope, what are the results of our salvation, our justification? Based upon this text, the first one is a relationship, a relationship that is now at peace because of G- with Jesus Christ, and we can now invest in this relationship. The second thing is rejoicing in the suffering. We now have power to rejoice in our suffering, come with joy. And the last thing is it gives us Christ. It gives us Christ. We've been reconciled to the Father, and now we have the Godhead, and the Holy Spirit lives in us, and we are with them. So as we wrap up this summer, one hope, as we wrap up the summer, let us not coast in our spiritual walk. Let our spiritual health not be on the back burner, but come to the front burner. Let these next few weeks of the summer be a time where we rejuvenate our relationship with the Lord. Let us be reminded that we have a relationship with Him and it's an investment that we should put in. Let us not pull our investment out. Let us not give up, although church might be hard, watching this video, doing these different things. Maybe it might be a little bit difficult. You want to see people. You want to get out a little bit more. I understand that and I'm with you right there. I'm I'm with you. Eye to eye. I, I see what you mean. But let us not... Give up on our investment just yet. Let us persevere in the time that we see as hard. Knowing that Christ died for us yet, that we were even sinners. Even in the midst of that, Christ died for us. And now he's at the Father saying that it's those people, Father, that I've died for. You've sent me to die for. I pray this message was encouraging to you and that we would Rain fresh in our spiritual life. Enjoy the rest of your summer, one hope, and be blessed. Amen.